Amygdala. Odian. Celestial Emissary. The Great Ones. The Great Ones are a race of eldritch godlike entities that reside within the universe of Bloodborne. They serve as the main antagonistic race in Bloodborne. They are a group of extremely powerful, multidimensional beings that can exist across several planes of existence. They have often been described as gods, and play a mysterious yet crucial role in the game's plot, as well as its overall lore. The Great Ones are inspired from the works of H. P. Lovecraft, who wrote various books about eldritch horrors called Great Old Ones, Cosmic Entities with Godlike Powers and Forbidden Knowledge. There is a certain amount of confusion surrounding what constitutes a true Great One and how to distinguish them from a kin. This stems from the fact that kin bosses have tremendous power and abilities that can be considered to be godlike. Due to the fact that both have an alien appearance, it becomes hard to determine whether one is a true great one, or an extremely powerful and oversized kin. The kin are human beings that were graced by eldritch knowledge, through the contact with the great ones. Great ones themselves are unknown beings that are impossible to explain and comprehend through human thought. They merely exist, and they have desires and motives. The Great Ones are supernatural beings with incredible strength and stamina. They are demonic and godly in both appearance and abilities. The Celestial Emissary has the ability to disguise itself as a lesser kin to deceive enemies. The brain of Menses can cause frenzy with its stare. Murgo's wet nurse can summon illusionary copies within a nightmare realm. The Moon Presence has the ability to levitate and controls the hunter's dream. Ebriatus, daughter of the cosmos, is able to create a more powerful star explosion akin to a call beyond. Amygdala resides within the nightmare frontier and can create devastating lasers with its eyes. And Ram, the vacuous spider, is able to summon spider like underlings at will. As seen with the hunter, it is possible for humans to become great ones. Humanity knowledge and encounter of the great ones starts with the healing church and its secret pursuit to summon or harness the power of the Great Ones. The Great Ones are not of this world, but powerful enough to be seen as gods. They were worshipped by most Yarnamites, either directly or indirectly. Moreover, Great Ones are eldritch beings that reside on a higher plane than humanity. They are initially revered by the scholars in Bergenworth. The Great Ones either directly or indirectly cause the scourge of the beast a blood-borne affliction tracing back to contaminated blood found within the lost labyrinth of Thamru. They were here, in the labyrinth, long ago. They appear to be much closer than you'd think at Bergenworth. Men were sent into the labyrinth, and an academy was built to understand the strange discoveries inside, generally called the truth. It seems the truth is a terrible thing, slowly breaking the mind of anyone who delves too deeply. Awful things happened at Bergenworth, and as a result, the church closed off not only the academy, but the entire forest, calling it forbidden. Whether or not the Great Ones are actually gods or just higher levels of beings is inconsequential. The question itself is entirely academic. The important thing is, they exist. They have an influence on the world. They appear to be ageless, but they can be killed. Their powers are strange things often involving teleportation or energy or things that the human world cannot do. Even perceiving the Great Ones properly requires great amounts of insight something Master Willem tried to do, at his own cost. One of strongest Great Ones appears to be the Moon Presence, the creator of the nightmare the hunter is trapped within. Others are Eden, Ram, Murgo's wet nurse, Amygdala, the Celestial Emissary, the Brain of Menses, and Ebriatus. Eden, one of their number, has transcended beyond the others, to the point that he no longer has a physical body but instead is just a voice and an influence. He is very powerful and has become sort of, timeless, thus potentially making him the most powerful, yet the most indirect, of the Great Ones. He is also the only Great One explicitly referred to as male, with all the others' genders either female or undefined, assuming the Great Ones even have humanly definable genders. Some items' descriptions tell about Great Ones living in the dream and others living in the nightmare. Humans have been able to contact them through the use of phantasm, little invertebrates found in the labyrinth. Interestingly, 
Murgo's wet nurse and the moon presence are themselves never directly identified as great ones. Whether this is merely an oversight or an indication that they are indeed a different class of being is unknown. The plague was used as an outlet by the great ones as an attempt to find a surrogate for their lost children. As evidenced in description of each one-third of umbilical cord, this process involved the pale blood moon and an attempt to foster a new child for a great one that lost their own. In the world of bloodborne, babies that are treated as special, in one way or the other are offered as lures to the great ones. When it comes to living creatures, the stronger or more advanced you are, the fewer offspring you produce in your life. The great ones have all lost their children because of their positions, and as a result, they're attracted to these special babies. The babies are one way of calling them. Every great one loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate, and Eden, the formless great one, is no different. To think, it was corrupted blood that began this eldritch liaison. The great ones can be classified into three distinct groups, true, kin and failed great ones. True great ones. Amygdala are great ones and bloodborne. One appears as a boss in amygdala's chamber in the nightmare frontier. Meanwhile, others populate various locations throughout the game as non-playable characters, sometimes serving as methods of transportation between areas. Amygdala also appears as chalice dungeon bosses in the cursed Thamirian defilement, Lower Lorin, and his gravestone. Amygdala are monstrous entities with spider-like bodies, a short tail and a head which is very similar to a part of the brain called the amygdala or amygdala body. Their many bulbous eyes bulge when they use arcane attacks. They have six-fingered hands on their seven arms, and reptilian talons on their two legs. Many also sport tendrils on their faces. Amygdala appear to be some of the most widely revered of their kind. This is indicated by the numerous statues of them lining the cathedral ward in Yahargul, unseen village. A much larger statue, which appears to be part of a shrine, is located in the church of the Hypogean jail. Many amygdala populate the world, dwelling atop the sides of various large buildings. One amygdala came to inhabit an area in the nightmare frontier known as Amygdala's Chamber. Patches the spider is seemingly one of the most devoted of this amygdala's worshippers and offers sacrifices to his god through the use of the tonsil stone, transporting them into the nightmare frontier. However, after the hunter slays the amygdala, he expresses no remorse or anger, merely believing they bestowed salvation upon the entity. It is unknown what amygdala is like or what it has to do with the lesser amygdala, but it is said that the great ones are sympathetic in nature. So it is believed that it wants to watch over humanity and help. Humanity's inability to comprehend them complicates such an ideal. It is worshipped by humanity as a deity, the school of Menses having various statues of it found all across its architecture. It also seems to desire human sacrifices, as one of its followers sends humans to it to be offered in tribute on a regular basis. Not much is given on what sort of powers Amygdala possesses but it can be assumed that it has all of the basic powers of a great one. Amygdala is immortal, having lived through a considerable sum of humanity's history. But its flesh and blood nature makes it able to be killed by mortal means. Like all great ones, its very presence grants people insight, essentially boosting one's madness. It can also rip off two of its own arms to slam the player without affecting its health. The Lesser Amygdala are a group of Great Ones that appear in Bloodborne to act as obstacles for the hunter. The Lesser Amygdala are monstrous entities with a spider-like body, a short tail, and what appears to be a fly-like head with many bulbous eyes that bulge when it uses its arcane attack. It has six-fingered hands on its eight arms, and reptilian talons on its two legs. Unlike the true Amygdala, these creatures possess a stream of tentacles on their heads. It is unknown what the true purpose of the various amygdalas is there to enact. But it is said that the great ones are sympathetic in nature. So it is believed that they could be there to watch over humanity and help. Humanity's inability to comprehend them complicates such an ideal. This could be believed when the hunter can use them to teleport to important areas. It is also unknown how they relate to the true amygdala, whether they are servants, 
the same species of Great One or some kind of metaphysical extension of it. Unlike the other Great Ones, the lesser amygdala can only be seen by the hunter when it has 40 or more insight, though they can be seen even if the hunter has less should the pale blood moon shine in the sky. They seem to also possess the ability to teleport others. A specific item like the tonsil stone or the eye of a blood drunk hunter can teleport them to a specific area. Though this will also inflict frenzy on the hunter, which could kill the hunter instantly should there be enough. As beings from a higher plane of existence great ones all share immortality, super strength, stamina and a strong connection to the realm of nightmares. Their other powers vary in variety and magnitude, ranging from teleportation and minion creation to formlessness and omnipotence within their own domain. However, as most are still flesh and bone based, they can easily be killed as any mortal creature with the right skills and weapons. Another great one is the brain of Menses. The brain of Menses inhabits the nightmare of Menses. It is a massive brain-looking creature, covered in eyes, with a long twisted arm that ends in a beastly clawed hand. It is the reason why the hunter is being induced with frenzy when first arriving in the nightmare of Menses. A lever can be activated, triggering a cut scene in which the brain is dropped into the abyss of the tower it overlooks. After this is done, the hunter will not receive damage when walking outside the tower. Once the brain has been dropped, the hunter can finish it off by accessing a dark abyss via a newly available cage elevator in the Panopticon. Broken and helpless, the brain is incapable of attacking the hunter in any way, observing them and following it with its now harmless and pitiful gaze. Upon investigating the nightmare, the school of Menses discovered an eldritch mind, lined with the sacred and elusive eyes on the inside that were said to be the key to evolution. But these eyes were of some inexplicably evil nature, and the brain had immense rot. So that its gaze would drive mortals lethally mad with frenzy even though they could not see it from a large distance. Despite this, the brain of Menses was still a true great one, and the scholars left it there. Next great one is Ebriadas, daughter of the cosmos. Ebriadas is a left-behind great one who inhabits the altar of despair at the back of the Grand Cathedral in Yarnum. A relative of the eldritch great ones, Ebriadas is a monstrous creature that resembles a slug with squid-like tentacles emerging from her back. Her face appears split in half and is covered in strange growths that resemble fungus that surround her vulnerable head. Only red flesh is seen, so it is possible that she has no real mouth. But, despite being a kin which most of them have bulging and globular yellow eyes, she has only two oval-shaped green eyes. Ebriadas also possesses a set of skeletal wings that grant her limited flight. The fact that this being is the conduit between the Church and the Great Ones, coupled with the title of daughter and her appearance, possibly shows that she is the first celestial child. Like most of the kin she has gray-yellow blood but is able to spit a red fluid, similar to human blood, that inflicts frenzy. When the player finds her she seems to be mourning, or simply sleeping, at the altar of despair, which appears to house the corpse of a dead being that resembles Ram. Little is known about Ebriada's origins, although it is possible she was a Thamerian ascended through kin. She originated from the land of Is, located in the labyrinths of the Chalice Dungeon. She would be discovered by the Healing Church, which founded the choir to protect and study her. As the only great one who sought to coexist with humans, Ebriadas donated her blood to the church. The church grew to worship Ebriadas, particularly her blood that they used for their practice of blood ministration. However, as time went on, the church became abusive through their usage of Ebriadas and her blood for their rituals. Ebriadas is a great one from the land of Is a plane located in the deeper reaches of the Chalice Dungeon Labyrinth. According to the choir, the land of Is lies in contact with the cosmos, which allowed the Great Ones who resided there to function on transcendental planes of thought. The Augur of Ebriadas suggests that the Church was able to use phantasms, which are slug-like invertebrates known to be Augurs of the Great Ones, to partially summon Ebriadas. We can see this in the game, 
When the player uses the Augur of Ebriatus a cosmic rift opens up and a number of Ebriatus tentacles forcefully project through before being suddenly severed off to fall to the ground. The initial encounter with Ebriatus through her phantasms marked the start of an inquiry into the cosmos from within the old labyrinth, essentially a search for the land of Is which lies in contact with the cosmos. To undertake the task, an elite delegation of the healing church known as the Choir was formed. The Choir was formed out of those high-ranking, elite members of the healing church who founded the orphanage, a place where these members could pursue scholarship and experimentation. As the name suggests, the subjects of their experimentation were those vulnerable children, with no one to miss them, who would become potent unseen thinkers for the healing church. The land of Is is reached through a ritual performed with the great Is chalice. This chalice was brought back to the surface after the time of the Bergenworth Schism and during an inquiry into the cosmos from within the labyrinth. Its ability to unlock the land of Is allowed the choir to have audience with Ebriatus face to face, rather than through partial summoning. Perhaps upon discovering Ebriatus the choir believed that they had finally had the breakthrough they needed. They had made contact with a seemingly legitimate Great One, and surely more would follow. However, the discovery of Ebriatus revealed a startling truth to the scholars, that at some point in history there had been a mass departure of Great Ones, and that as the augur of Ebriatus' description notes, Ebriatus herself had been abandoned. As it turned out, the choir and Ebriatus actually had goals that aligned in that both were seeking to rediscover the Great Ones, that true greatness, from long ago. The choir garb says that, together with the left-behind Great One, they look to the skies, in search of astral signs, that may lead them to the rediscovery of true greatness. We know of no other Great One described as left behind that has come into contact with the choir other than Ebriatus. This description therefore indicates that the choir and Ebriatus began working together to make contact with the Great Ones of the Cosmos. This also makes sense when we consider that Ebriatus is not hostile towards the player to begin with, indicating a tolerance and relationship with humanity. But why did they search among the cosmos? The choir stumbled upon an epiphany, very suddenly and quite by accident. Here we stand, feet planted in the earth, but might the cosmos be very near us, only just above our heads? And the choir declaring that the sky and the cosmos are one. Not only had the choir received the epiphany that the cosmos are very close by, but they also knew that Ebriatus, along with other great ones, had existed in close proximity with the cosmos. In the world of Bloodborne the cosmos are not the great chasm of space and stars above the atmosphere, but a plane that permeates and inhabits the space very close to that of the people of Yarnum, in the sky just above their heads. However, the limited human intellect is unable to function on such a transcendental plane, and must receive help from beings of higher planes, the Great Ones, for guidance. In order to elevate their thoughts, just as Provost Willem had attempted to do by lining his brain with eyes, the choir attempted to make contact with those Great Ones that inhabited the cosmos, a place so close yet so far out of reach. To do so they tried a great number of experiments. They tried using Ebriata's phantasms to reach a lofty plane of darkness, but failed to make contact with the outer reaches of the cosmos, instead creating a small exploding star. This is clearly a very dangerous means of attempted contact, and was discontinued. They tried creating contact through sound waves, like the bells that are used to contact other planes of existence by the hunters. To do so they made a bell that projects arcane sound across planes of existence, this too was likely using phantasms, as they are closely associated with imbuing objects with arcane power, the empty phantasm shell for example. Unfortunately this experiment was also a failure. It may be that the brain suckers are also a product of the choir's experimentation. He head of a brain sucker appears to have been cut open and a phantasm inserted. These phantasms ravenously seek out the insight or eyes, that line the brains of those they come into contact with. Perhaps it was after the failure of these experiments that the members of the choir realized the potential of their young orphan test subjects. As noted, the orphanage key explains that the children of the orphanage became potent unseen thinkers for the healing church. 
When the player travels to the orphanage they find a vast number of celestial emissaries. Celestial meaning positioned in or relating to the sky, or outer space as observed in astronomy and emissary meaning a person sent as a diplomatic representative on a special mission. These creatures were clearly created to make contact with the great ones of the cosmos, acting as emissaries on behalf of mankind. It is unknown how exactly they are created, but it is certain that they are not natural. Completing the imposter Iosefka quest will reveal to the player that those sent to her clinic became the celestial emissaries found within. Iosefka does give an interesting clue about how these emissaries are made when she says, I've received another patient. This time, I'll be trying old blood. I've achieved much. And I owe it all to you. Thanks. And cheers to the discovery of kinship. Doesn't it make you feel warm inside? This dialogue strongly indicates Iosefka anesthetized her patients through use of the blue elixir and that it is old blood that allowed her to create the emissaries. The created emissaries are known as kin of the cosmos. Ebriades herself is called Ebriades, daughter of the cosmos. The kin cold blood item reads, Cold blood of inhuman kin of the cosmos, brethren of the great ones. These pieces of evidence paint a picture. Iosefka, who is a member of the choir, was able to use blood collected from Ebriades to metamorphose, blood transforms those that imbibe it, a phenomenon seen throughout Bloodborne, her patients into kin of Ebriades the heads of these kin are swollen with eyes, a legacy of Willem's research, and they emit an unusual sound seemingly unconsciously, as though they are broadcasting. This use of Ebriata's blood was perhaps a major milestone for the choir and those carrying out the experiments. Prior to this, the church had forced their cerebral patients to imbibe water until their heads expanded with the markings of internal eyes, but now the blood of an actual great one meant that the experiments began to look less like the living failures and Saint Adeline by the end of her quest, and more like the celestial emissaries, whole and healthy beings with apparent agency. Ebriades bleeds two kinds of blood. The first kind is the common red blood, like red blood cells, that she will spit at the player. The second is blood with a clear, serum-like color, like plasma, and is seemingly the predominant type of blood she houses. The serum-like blood is not only found in Ebriades, but also in a number of other creatures related to the Great Ones. Serum blood is a contested blood type a careless merger of Iosefka's blood vial and brown blood. Many kin enemies have blue-gray blood, and other enemies, e.g. Orphan of Kos, Brain of Menses, Garden of Eyes, Children of Ram, supposedly bleeding, serum blood, actually have red blood. This seems to depend on where you encounter them. The creatures that may have serum blood include Brain Sucker, Children of Ram, Garden of Eyes, Winter Lantern, Celestial Child, Small Celestial Emissary, Fluorescent Flower, Ram, The Vacuous Spider, Amygdala, Celestial Emissary, Brain of Menses, Living Failures, Orphan of Kos, and Provost Willem. There are two major types of enemy in Bloodborne, Beast and Kin. According to the Kin Cold Blood item description, Kin enemies are known as Kin of the Cosmos, and are therefore likely related to Ebriadas by blood. While the above creatures do bleed the serum like blood, evidence from the official Bloodborne Guide indicates that not all creatures that bleed the pale serum like blood are necessarily kin to Ebriatus. Particularly interesting is that while Ram is not considered kin by the official guide, she does drop kin cold blood upon being defeated. There are unexplained aspects to Ebriatus and her predicament that would appear to involve Ram or a creature almost identical to Ram in form. When the player first encounters Ebriades she is prostrated before the altar of despair. It may be that she is sleeping, perhaps praying or perhaps that she is overcome with sadness. It is no secret that every great one loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate, and perhaps this is no different for Ebriades. Scattered throughout the upper cathedral ward the player will encounter dense concentrations of celestial children or larvae which is a kin creature. These creatures bleed pale kin blood when attacked, and almost exactly resemble a very juvenile form of the fully grown Ebriatus. Their slug-like bodies, 
large round heads, protruding tubes upon their faces and especially, the tiny wings that look so much like Ebriata's all give them away as her spawn. Their very existence tells us that Ebriata's and the choir were attempting to create a child of a great one. We can theorize how these spawn came into being through the events of Ariana's story. Ariana gives birth to a celestial larvae, indicating that the church must have used human women to carry the spawn of Ebriata's. Ariana is certainly one who has imbibed much blood from those ministers of the church. Is it not likely that she would have came into the possession of the blood of Ebriata's from the church ministers who visited her at some point in her career? Then it took the descent of the blood moon to conceive the celestial child that she would give birth to. Perhaps these creatures would eventually grow up to be great ones, or perhaps they are pale imitations of even Ebriata's greatness. Atop the altar of despair sits a figure almost identical to Ram, the vacuous spider. However, this creature is seemingly dead and gray. As we know through the quest line of Queen Annalise of Canehurst, the altar is able to reverse the flow of time under special circumstances. Could it be that Ebriata's placed her child upon the altar in an attempt to bring it back? The proliferation of celestial children certainly indicates that Ebriata's sought a surrogate, so then where is her original child, if not on the altar? The ties between Ebriata's and this rom-like creature go deeper than proximity. Ebriata's name gives us a clue. Ebriata's may get her name from the Ebriata's butterfly a species of butterfly found in South America, which matches the, although admittedly distorted form, of Ebriata's as having an almost butterfly-like appearance. What is even more interesting is what the Ebriata's butterfly looks like in its larval stage as a caterpillar. From this we can see that the resemblance to Ram is almost uncanny. This information is very illuminating and leads to much speculation. From it we can be relatively confident in theorizing that Ram's form is a larval stage of the same kind of great one as Ebriata's, indicating the creature atop the altar is indeed the child of Ebriata's that has since died, leaving Ebriata's abandoned once more. In the end, the fact that imposter Iosefka is still attempting to make contact with the great ones using the means of the choir, may indicate that the choir's attempts at contact were never successful that despite the many experiments and seeming success, Ebriata's and her human helpers were unable to rediscover the true greatness they sought so desperately. Orphan of Kos Orphan of Kos is a newly born Great One. Child of the deceased Great One Kos and host of the Hunter's Nightmare, the Orphan of Kos appears as the final boss of the Bloodborne DLC game The Old Hunters. The offspring of the deceased Kos, the orphan is a tall, skeletal humanoid that disturbingly resembles a hunter. Its mouth is permanently fixed in a rictus grin and it constantly screams throughout the fight. A thin membrane is draped across its back like a cape, which transforms into a pair of wings when the orphan enters its second form. The orphan wields its placenta in combat akin to a club or flail, and it can tear pieces off to use as explosive projectiles. After it transforms, the placenta mutates into a weapon resembling a gigantic axe or glaive. When it is born, it looks up at the dark son of the nightmare that it has been born into and cries, full of despair. When the hunter gets too close, the orphan goes completely mad, running at the hunter and attacking them relentlessly. Despite its emaciated, corpse-like appearance, the orphan of Kos is arguably one of the most powerful enemies in Bloodborne. It is quick and nimble, able to move about very quickly. The orphan uses its placenta as a bludgeon, and is shown to be incredibly strong. When low on health, the orphan's attacks become even more unforgiving, and can even call upon a flurry of thunder to cover the field in waves of electricity. Kos was a great one who washed up on the shores of a fishing hamlet long before the events of the present day. When Kos washed up on the shore, it was in the late stages of its pregnancy, but like all great ones, was unable to produce offspring by natural means. In this case Kos died before the child was born, leaving its child an orphan. This child and the corpse of Kos developed a cult-like following amongst the villagers who worshipped it. They were aware that Kos had been pregnant, as the befuddled villager can be heard intoning a plea of mercy for the poor wizened child. Kos' corpse was teeming with parasites or phantasms unlike any found in humans. 
the villagers appear to have harvested these parasites. Considering the reverence with which they treat the corpse of Kos, it may be that these parasites left the host behind once it had died, and that the villagers collected them up, rather than touching or examining the body. The parasites can be seen everywhere in the village, being used as fuel for fire, collected into large pools and seemingly fused with the men and women of the village in order to bring about a rebirth in form. The villagers regarded Kos as a mother, likely because of this very rebirth. Around this time the scholars of Bergenworth were studying the Great Ones, and Willem was desperately searching for the umbilical cord of a Great One. Towards that end, the scholars and hunters of Bergenworth came to the fishing hamlet and experimented on the villagers there in the most gruesome ways. The villagers defended themselves and so the hunters used force in order to extract information. The hunters came upon the corpse of Kos, worshipped by the villagers and what follows is unclear. According to one of the villagers the hunters committed an act of blasphemy against the poor wizened child. What seems most likely is that the hunters tore the orphan or at least the orphan's umbilical cord from the corpse of Kos, ending whatever chance it may have had at life. The village chanters have a line which reads, Mother is dead, her baby taken strongly indicating that the wizened orphan was torn from its mother's womb by the hunters. For this act the hunters were cursed by the villagers, who incited the wrath of the great ones against them. Interestingly, it is strongly implied that German and Maria were the hunters who committed the blasphemous act, making them a metaphorical Adam and Eve and calling forth the concept of original sin in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Any and all who inherit there will by becoming hunters inherit the curse. The curses of the villagers seem to have manifested in the hunter's nightmare. Simon explains the origins of the hunter's nightmare. Do you know why the hunters are drawn to this nightmare? because it sprouted from their very misdeeds. This village is the true secret. Testament to the old sins. It feeds this hunter's nightmare, said Simon the Harrowed. The village feeds the nightmare. It is the villagers and their ire at the treatment of their great one which motivated them to call forth their curses. Perhaps the consciousness of Coast listened from whatever plane of existence it resides in and established the nightmare, watching over it from the sky. Michael Ash certainly seems to have grounds for at least questioning whether Kos can hear his prayers when he says, Ah, uh, Kos, or some say Kosm, do you hear our prayers? said Michael Ash, host of the nightmare. And perhaps these grounds are the establishment of the hunter's nightmare through the villagers' prayers to Kos. The orphan itself, upon disentangling itself from its mother's still form will weep and stare up at the sky, perhaps aware, on some level of the magnitude of its loss. When the spirit of the orphan is able to return to the ocean it appears to be a good thing, implying that the orphan was not allowed to return to the ocean during its lifetime, but was likely taken by the scholars. Allowing the orphan to return to the ocean as it should have done long ago, satiates the villagers in their anger, and perhaps brings an end to the curse that plagues the hunters. Another noticeable true great one is Murgo and Murgo's wet nurse. The wet nurse is a great one who is seemingly sustaining Murgo. The lamp atop Murgo's loft that spawns where the wet nurse was fought is called the wet nurse's linarium. Murgo is never met in game, but is likely the child of Yarnum, the Myrian queen and her liaison with a great one. Because the baby's cries can be heard during the blood moon and because there is a pram in the boss room of Murgo's wet nurse but no child is ever seen, it may be that Murgo is the child of formless Eden. Murgo's wet nurse is a strange towering creature with six skeletal arms and two black tattered wings. Strangely enough, the appearance of this being appears to be rather Thamerian, despite its bizarre features, with its long, black, hooded dress and various jewels. It has the power of creating a pocket dimension with multiple copies of itself and is able to teleport. But at close range it uses six curved swords with surprising speed and range as its limbs stretch out and spin in a devastating manner, shredding enemies who get caught in the flurry of slices. Murgo's wet nurse is a great one who inhabits the nightmare of Menses residing in a linarium known as the wet nurse's linarium atop the larger of the two nightmare cathedrals. There is no written or spoken lore about Murgo's wet nurse, 
and any conclusions about the entity known as Murgo's wet nurse must be drawn from contextual and circumstantial evidence. When the player approaches the wet nurse's linarium for the first time they are able to hear the sounds of a baby's cry emanating from the pram in the center of the circular area. Upon approaching the pram Murgo's wet nurse will drop down from the sky and stoop over to cover the pram with its wings, silencing the baby's more immediate cries. With six of its eight arms, the wet nurse then draws what appear to be burial blades in order to attack. The wet nurse's appearance and reaction to the player seem like the response of a protector or caretaker for the baby that was in the cradle. Given that the wet nurse is the wet nurse for Murgo, and that wet nurses are only a required role for taking care of a baby. We can safely assume that the baby in the cradle is Murgo and that the wet nurse is attempting to protect Murgo from any harm that may come to it. The Nightmare of Menses contains a significant amount of references to Murgo. Murgo's attendants and chief attendants roam the halls just below the linarium. The smaller attendants seem to resemble court jesters, with their almost comical appearance and mask helmets, which resemble jesters' hats. The chief attendants with their wide girths seem to resemble maids and helper women who could attend to household chores. The winter lanterns, while grotesque in appearance, can be heard singing a tune out of key. This tune may be some sort of lullaby, perhaps one intended to soothe a crying baby. These creatures all seem to serve a purpose within the nightmare, attending on Murgo. The presence of these creatures indicate that the nightmare of Menses is linked to Murgo implying that the nightmare is Murgo's domain and that the wet nurse is one of the creatures that inhabits that domain. Murgo, then, must be a very important baby in considering the large household of servants, perhaps even one of royal birth. One-third umbilical cord Murgo's wet nurse description states, A great relic, also known as the cord of the eye. Every infant great one has this precursor to the umbilical cord. Every great one loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate. This cord granted Menses an audience with Murgo, but resulted in the stillbirth of their brains. Used to gain insight and, so they say, eyes on the inside, although no one remembers what that truly entails. The school of Menses, whose actions led to the nightmare becoming accessible, were attempting to contact Murgo. And in Michael Ash's words be granted eyes, to have eyes planted on their brains in order to cleanse them of their beastly idiocy and allow them to ascend into something more than human as Ram once did. In order to do so the school conducted a ritual. This ritual beckoned the blood moon closer and allowed Menses to gain audience with Murgo. Murgo lacks physical form. The baby was never actually born, but instead it would seem that it was stillborn, physically perishing within its mother's womb. This is perhaps why Murgo lacks any kind of perceivable physical form, instead existing as a slumbering consciousness only heard through a voice, that of a crying baby. Murgo's consciousness was awoken, but it was infantile and underdeveloped. Like any baby who is woken abruptly from a deep sleep, Murgo's first inclination was to cry. Special babies act as lures to other great ones and Murgo's harrowing cry from within the nightmare drew the blood moon closer. Whatever the details of what happened next are we do not know, but the audience of Menses with Murgo resulted in the stillbirth of their brains, ending their life, at least in human form, and mass. The ritual conducted by Menses seems to be the cause of the hunt as the baby was left to cry without recourse. Where the wet nurse itself comes from is completely obscure. It appears to be called into existence upon approaching the pram of Murgo. If we think about the role of a wet nurse in reality, their job is to feed a baby, providing safety and comfort. The other bosses of Bloodborne fit into the world, existing in the places where they are expected to be based on the lore surrounding them. But Murgo's wet nurse seems to appear out of nowhere, never being mentioned by any character or text prior to encountering it. These facts, along with the following physical characteristics don't seem to add up. The wet nurse resembles a crow and is very reminiscent of Eileen's crow feather garb, an outfit worn by the hunter of hunters for each generation. Also the wet nurse wields weaponry that resembles Germans' burial blades and the blades of mercy. These weapons are both formed of siderite which is said to be a mineral of the heavens. This seems to indicate that the wet nurse has something to do with the origins of the hunter of hunters and the hunters themselves. 
that somehow Garman and his colleagues encountered it during the days of Bergenworth. If this was the case, then what was the point of Menzies contacting Murgo? Bergenworth likely already did it. The illogical and seemingly random connections here can perhaps be put down to the from software artists liking the design, rather than an in-game lore connection. Despite being supported by something, there is nothing visible under the wet nurse's hood. This does not mean the nurse is formless, however, as arms covered in feathers can be seen wielding its arsenal of blades. The wet nurse does not bleed blood. When struck, a vapor-like substance is ripped from it, and the same sound effect used when hitting the ghostly maidens of Canehurst plays. The wet nurse is able to duplicate itself seemingly infinitely. This seems to fit with the idea that the Murgo's wet nurse is an apparition, a creature being called down before the player's eyes by something else. After defeating Murgo's wet nurse the player can hear the baby's cries resume, and then quieten down till the point where gentle snores can be heard. Murgo has returned to its slumber. The baby evidently seeks comfort, a means of going back to sleep. Perhaps in order to try to achieve this it manufactured a companion, a protector and soother, the wet nurse. From within the corpse of coast its orphan is able to manufacture a body, one that is powerful and capable of defending both it and its mother's corpse. The orphan itself exists only as a faint ghostly presence, still bound to its mother's still body. If this is possible with the orphan of Kos, then Murgo, being the baby of a great one, should be similarly powerful. Though simply speculation, the evidence could certainly be construed this way. Another theory about its origin states that the wet nurse is Murgo, or was created by Murgo. The wet nurse drops a third of umbilical cord. Ariana's story shows us that when you kill her child it drops an umbilical cord. The pram or baby carriage at the top of the nightmare of Menses is empty, indicating that the baby is either formless or that the cry is emanating from somewhere else, perhaps above. The cry of the baby can be heard throughout the fight. The wet nurse does not bleed, rather it has the exact same sound effect and bleed effect, which looks like smoke, as the cane her spirits, indicating that it is not entirely physical but rather an apparition. The wet nurse is able to create seemingly infinite copies of itself from within the nightmarish purple smoke it creates during the battle with it. A similar effect which can be seen when opening the door from the lecture building to the nightmare of Menses and Nightmare Frontier. These copies again indicate that the wet nurse is not a being of flesh and blood, but rather a projection or creation. A possible explanation for the wet nurse being Murgo, or more likely. A being created by Murgo is that Murgo needed its mother but she was not able to be there for it, so it created the wet nurse to take care of it. The orphan of Kos, though seemingly unborn, was still able to create a physical form in which to defend itself from within the nightmare. So it may be that Murgo is essentially doing the same, though perhaps at a weaker level due to its shared heritage of being born to a Thamerian rather than a legitimate great one. Next true great one is the moon presence also known as the blood moon. The moon presence is a nameless great one in the world of bloodborne, a being synonymous with the blood moon, pale blood and the likely source of the hunter's dream. Its actions are the primary instigator and driving force behind many of the events and situations that have arisen in Yarnum and throughout that world's history. The moon presence is the main antagonist in bloodborne. It is the master of Germen and the great one that bound him to the hunter's dream. An eldritch being composed of human flesh and bone, with the exception of its head. It is covered in dozens of tentacles, mainly in its head, where they resemble hair and tail. Its body is mainly a large human spine and ribs. Moon presence doesn't have a face, instead it only has a hole in its head. It's the great one which created and rules over the hunter's dream. Defeating it will result in the childhood beginning's ending. Before being encountered by the hunter, the moon presence had bound Garman, the first hunter to the hunter's dream. The dream is an outlet seemingly used by the moon presence to further its own desires, mainly involving the killing of the other great ones. Whether or not this has to do with halting the scourge of the beast and the slaughter of other great ones is currently unknown. However, 
A note found on the upper floor of the lecture hall lends legitimacy to the idea that the moon presence is actively seeking out and trying to eliminate other great ones for an unknown purpose. Unlike most great ones, it does not have any blatantly malicious intent and even implied to be benevolent for the hunters. The umbilical cord in the workshop implied that German invited the moon presence in the first place due to not being able to cope with the loss of Lady Maria, who was the origin of the plain doll. The moon presence is absolutely synonymous with the blood moon. Whether it actually is the blood moon or whether it resides on the blood moon is unclear. When it is seen descending in the hunter's dream, it appears at the same time that the blood moon becomes visible indicating that when the blood moon descends, so does the moon presence. However, its physical form actually descends from the moon, indicating it is a separate entity, that the moon is simply a place in which it lives which it seems to exercise control over. Interestingly, the moon in Bloodborne does not appear to be in space as it is in our reality. But rather the moon seen in the sky is actually within the atmosphere, so low to the ground that clouds are able to pass in front of and behind it. The moon presence is perhaps then, a manifestation of the moon, a physical form for an abstract idea. The blood moon and therefore the moon presence have appeared multiple times in the history of Bloodborne. We know from the artifacts and descriptions found concerning the Thumerian civilization under Queen Yarnum that long ago the blood moon was seen in the land of Lauren. Its appearance, mixed with the use of old blood, triggered the scourge of beasthood. Beasthood was understood to be a contagious plague that transformed those afflicted with it into hideous and bloodthirsty beasts. In reality, it would appear that the proximity of the moon and therefore the moon presence mixed with use of the old blood is what triggers the transformation in humans and Temerians into beast-like creatures. The beast-like creatures which humans and Temerians become themselves have many physical and thematic ties to the moon presence's actual appearance. The beastly paws with talon-like claws, the quadrupedal movement, the tail and the exposed ribcage all resemble the scourge beasts and silver beasts encountered in the waking world and nightmares. A similar phenomenon is seen in the citizens of the fishing hamlet, where its village men and especially the snail women strongly physically resemble Kos, a legitimate great one in close proximity to the villagers whose phantasms and blood were clearly being utilized in one form or another. Despite the unfathomable nature of the Great Ones, one clear goal seems to unite them all. All Great Ones lose their natural-born children through one means or another and like all Great Ones the Moon Presence appears to be primarily motivated with finding a surrogate to replace its lost offspring. With this knowledge in hand we can understand some of the events of Bloodborne's history with more clarity. The Themerians were a superhuman race, more akin to Great Ones than humans are. Their queen, Yarnum, was the bearer of a special baby through the use of special blood. Special babies draw the attention of great ones who seek to make the baby their surrogate. By drawing near, the moon presence triggered the scourge amongst the citizens of Lauren, a Thumerian civilization, because of the great one blood which had distributed amongst the population. The physical death of Yarnum's baby in utero may have caused the moon presence to retreat, and thereby bring an end to the scourge for the time being. The rediscovery of old blood in the tombs below Yarnum by the scholars of Bergenworth once again set off a chain of events that would lead to the blood moon. The old blood was distributed to the population of Yarnum by the healing church, and the slumbering consciousness of Queen Yarnum's baby Mergo was awoken by the school of Menses through their ritual. These two circumstances caused the spread of the scourge amongst the population of Yarnum when the blood moon drew close. Whether the moon presence intentionally causes beasthood is unclear. However, long before the events of present-day Yarnum, the moon presence made a contract with Germen who became the first in a long line of hunters. The hunter's role was to hunt the beasts created by the use of old blood and the proximity of the blood moon to absorb their blood and to have the lingering will of that blood channeled into strength by the moon presence's automaton servant. The fate of the majority of hunters was to succumb to the effects of the old blood and the blood lust it conceived transforming them into more dangerous and hideous beasts than any of their prey. As noted earlier, the primary motivation of great ones is to create a surrogate child for themselves, a legitimate offspring and heir. 
Towards this end it can be construed that the hunters and the hunter's dream was created in order to artificially conceive of an heir for the moon presence. It is true that the fate of most hunters is to become a beast themselves, but there appear to be special hunters who are largely immune to the effects of the scourge. These hunters have pale blood flowing through their veins. In reality, human blood is separated into several groups, platelets, red blood cells, white blood cells and plasma. White blood cells are a body's natural defense against infection and disease. They multiply and adapt to squash out threats to their host. Perhaps pale blood and blood-borne acts in a similar way. Where this pale blood comes from is uncertain though. The moon presence appears to be synonymous with the term and the doll herself is filled with pale blood. Hunters come to the doll in order to strengthen themselves against the beasts. But as we know from the childhood's beginning ending, the strengthening of a hunter has the, perhaps unintended, consequence of drawing them closer in essence, and even appearance, to the great ones. Hunters are echo fiends, beings who imbibe the echoes or will of ancient blood to become more like a great one, a fitting surrogate. Within the hunter's dream there is a sole human occupant, a hunter who is trapped there without recourse. Gehrman considers the dream a nightmare, and being there torments him. Should the player defeat Gehrman in combat, the moon presence will reveal itself and descend in order to embrace the player to itself, in an almost loving way. Should the player have consumed the umbilical cords of past great ones, they will be able to resist the moon presence's influence and be reborn as a great one themselves. If they do not, then they will become a pawn of the moon presence, and in essence, its surrogate child, just as Gehrman was before them. This is the purpose of the hunter's dream and the moon presence's actions then, to find a surrogate for itself, like all great ones. The hunt draws those who are strong, the dream strengthens them further, transforming their weakness into strength such that they might become a suitable surrogate for the moon presence who seemingly orchestrates it all. If the player resists the moon presence, then it is a threat to the established order and powerful enough to disrupt it, so must be eliminated. In all cases the doll appears to be a tool, without willpower, though autonomous from the fate of the moon presence. It was created simply to nurture the hunters a dream, whatever form they may come in. A popular theory about the moon presence is that the moon presence is the source of the scourge of the beast. The hunter encounters the moon presence if they refuse Gehrman's offer of mercy and defeat him. The moon presence descends from the blood moon itself, even its name implies a deep connection to the blood moon. As we know, the blood moon rises whenever the line between man and beast is blurred. When humans succumb to the scourge of the beast, the blood moon rises, or perhaps it's the other way around. Perhaps it's that the blood moon rises, causing those infected with the scourge to transform into beasts. At the beginning of the game, we find a note in the back of the hunter's dream, presumably left for the hunter. To escape this dreadful hunter's dream, halt the source of the spreading scourge of beasts, lest the night carry on forever. Now recall Gehrman's words to the hunter after the defeat of Father Gaskin. The moon is close. It will be a long hunt tonight. The blood moon, or rather the moon presence, is the source of the scourge. The potential for evolution exists within humanity but whether they will ascend to gods or descend to beasts is unclear. If the moon presence, the blood moon made flesh, is indeed the source of the scourge, then it can mean one of two things. The first possibility is likely the most outlandish and controversial, that being that the moon presence is the source of humanity, which in itself contains the scourge of the beast. The second, and I believe more likely scenario, is that while the beast lies within all of humanity, it is not unless they are tainted by the old blood that they become susceptible to corruption and the beast takes over. It is when the blood moon draws closer that those who have been infected with the scourge will succumb to their inner, terrible nature and become monsters. Also, it seems that Hidetaki Miyazaki was inspired by popular culture to do with werewolves and their transformation on the moon. Another theory is that the moon presence is the hero of Bloodborne. The moon presence has a name, and her name is Flora. This adds much needed context to the doll's strange prayer.
O flora of the moon, of the dream, O fleeting will of the ancients. Let the hunter be safe, let him her find comfort, and let this dream his her captor foretell a pleasant awakening. Flora to most people is what we call plants, and groups of plants in an ecosystem. You would think that connects her to the blood dew flowers all over the dream. But I think flora refers to the colony of bacteria that live within the body that protects it from infection. We know there was a great ascension, and most great ones left our plane of existence. Few remained, Ebrietas was left behind and became the church's blood pumper. Murgo's wet nurse remained to protect the nightmare newborn, but flora never seems to have a purpose. From a game dialogue, Garman treats Flora like a monster keeping him trapped in the dream, and she is scary looking, making her seem like an obvious villain. Here is where it gets interesting. The entire game is about menstrual cycles and the world is treated like the body. Everything is centered around blood, and birth, and eyes. Flora is our immune system. Even in the event of her kind ascending she chose to stay? She felt pity for humanity and wanted to rid us of the beast scourge to remove what came when humans communed with the Great Ones. Think about it this way, she takes Garman to be her surrogate, and pale blood hunters are her enforcers that go out, and on her command kill the beasts look at every other hunter in the game. All succumb to the beast scourge except the pale blood dream hunters, the player, Jura, and Eileen all three of us are perfectly normal. In Flora's vision we go out to hunt all the beasts, and leave the world safe for humanity to continue. The Yarnum sunrise ending is the true ending. We as the white blood cell fight off the infection and at the end of our use Flora and German release us from the dream back into the world where the sun shines bright. The alternate ending is equally good. German is freed and we remain with Flora to watch over Yarnum, ready to bring new pale blood hunters in the event of a new scourge. But the secret ending that has us kill Flora and become a great one initially seems like the best. We have finally ascended to what Master Willem could never do, but in our selfish act. Flora is no more, the dream burns and the Yarnum collapses. Another theory about the motives of the moon presence states. If we only analyze the experience of our own character, we could say the moon presence wanted us to kill Murgo and maybe that there's hostility between different great ones. But since we know that many other hunters like Eileen and Jura have also been through the hunter's dream, and as far as we know haven't killed any great ones, what was their purpose? What was the moon presence trying to achieve by having them go out and kill some beasts, and by what terms did German determine they had fulfilled their purpose and killed them to wake them up? Eden is a great one without form. Interestingly, Eden has a tomb in the game, implying it has died. The Yarnum Stone says, the queen lies dead, but her horrific consciousness is only asleep, and it stirs in unsettling motions. And the Is Chalice implies the Great Ones are able to function on transcendental planes of thought. It seems possible if not likely that Eden may have died, but continues to exist on a different plane of thought. Perhaps death simply takes the Great Ones to a different plane in the first place. Unlike most other Great Ones, Eden is only mentioned and is not seen at any time during the game. This could be because he has managed to ascend beyond even the other Great Ones, appearing only as a presence, or maybe a formless voice. Eden hails from an ancient land, similar to the other Great Ones. While the other Great Ones learn to ascend to a higher plane than any other race that would come after them, Eden somehow managed to ascend to a higher plane than the rest. This resulted in him never having to have a physical form. This is evidenced by the rune shown above, titled Formless Eden. Both Eden and his inadvertent worshippers surreptitiously seek the precious blood. Eden is likely the father of the infant Mergo, a product of his union with Yarnum, the Myrian queen. Eden might have used Ariana's position as a prostitute, and her origin as a distant relative to Queen Annalise to use the blood she was exchanging with people to impregnate her. The latter seems to be more correct since the third umbilical cord collected from her child states. Every great one loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate, and Eden, the formless great one, is no different. To think, it was corrupted blood that began this eldritch liaison. 
multiple citizens of Yarnum possess one of Eden's two runes. This could mean that they either directly or indirectly worship him. As there is a chapel dedicated to him in the middle of Cathedral Ward, most probably do knowingly worship him. Next group is the King Great Ones and here is a brief notice of some of them. Ram, also known as the Vacuous Spider, is a minor antagonist in Bloodborne. She is a kin of the Great Ones stationed by coast to protect the barrier between dreams and reality, hiding the many horrors that the Pale Blood Moon should bring. Despite her title, Ram resembles a gigantic pill bug or a caterpillar rather than an arachnid. She has a silverfish-like tail and a bulbous body from which vegetation appears to be growing, possibly cold blood flowers. Her face resembles a chunk of pumice and is covered in eyes, suggesting its connection to the Great Ones. Her name, Vacuous, suggests that Ram is brain-dead, so her thoughts are so far beyond human understanding that Ram cannot communicate her findings to humanity. Apart from when the hunter attacks her, Ram is completely docile. Ram has the power to summon her offspring who fall from the sky when she is first attacked. At a distance, Ram can shoot large ice crystals skyward that land on the hunter. She can also create a magical blast from arcane magic. If attacked long enough, Ram can teleport to another part of the dimension, which spawns another batch of her children. Ram the vacuous spider is akin or brethren to the great ones of the cosmos. Ram's large gray, rock-hard head is pockmarked with dull, seemingly sightless eyes that stare in all directions and a small round mouth filled with sharp teeth. Ram's body is overgrown with fluorescent flowers and additional dark eye-like shapes. Evidence indicates that Ram was the result of an experiment conducted at Bergenworth. When defeated she will drop a kin cold blood, the description of which reads, Dare not to delve into the world beyond humanity, the eldritch truth touched upon long ago at Bergenworth. And Michael Ash, member of the School of Menses, and scholar of Bergenworth gives a clearer picture of Ram's origins. Ah, uh, Kos, or some say Kosm. Do you hear our prayers? As you once did for the vacuous Ram, grant us eyes, grant us eyes. Plant eyes on our brains, to cleanse our beastly idiocy. Kin are humans who have ascended in one form or another. We see this throughout Bloodborne with enemies like the Celestial Emissaries, some of whom are created by Iosefka in the clinic as evidenced by the unfinished emissary on the operating table with the human hand, and the correlation between survivors who are sent to the clinic and their emissary counterparts. Living failures as precursors to the emissaries and clear products of the research patients add further strength to this connection. Brain suckers still retain much of their human form and appear to be humans who have been experimented on with phantasms. And the Garden of Eyes enemies are the clearest example of human experimentation, and specifically the approach of inquiry that began with Master Willem at Bergenworth. Great One's wisdom description reads, At Bergenworth, Master Willem had an epiphany. We are thinking on the basis of planes. What we need are more eyes. I rune description reads, Eyes symbolize the truth Master Willem sought in his research. Disillusioned by the limits of human intellect, Master Willem looked to beings from higher planes for guidance, and sought to line his brain with eyes in order to elevate his thoughts. The Garden of Eyes are students or research subjects of Bergenworth who have had their brain lined with eyes in order to elevate their being and thoughts. The process appears to have driven them insane and vastly altered their bodies. Their swollen heads pockmarked with eyes resemble Ram's. It's easy to draw the connection that Ram underwent a similar process, and yet the result was vastly different. Again, Michael Ash perhaps provides us with a clue. Ah, uh, Kos, or some say Kosm. Do you hear our prayers? As you once did for the vacuous Ram, grant us eyes, grant us eyes. Plant eyes on our brains, to cleanse our beastly idiocy. We know from this that Kos is somehow inextricably linked to Ram's origins, and is even given credit for Ram's ascension. Third umbilical cord Iosefka description reads, Provost Willem sought the cord in order to elevate his being and thoughts to those of a great one, by lining his brain with eyes. The only choice he knew, if man were to ever match their greatness. 
Long ago in the fishing hamlet the Bergenworth scholars committed blasphemy. The body of the great one coast was discovered and studied, along with its unborn baby. The Bergenworth scholars' method of inquiry and experimentation is incredibly invasive, often to the detriment of the patient. A cursed brew description reads, Skull of a local from the violated fishing village. The inside of the skull was forcibly searched for eyes, as evidenced by innumerable scratches and indentations. It can be seen in the hunter's nightmare that the orphan of Kos has an umbilical cord and even uses the attached placenta as a weapon. It is a small leap to theorize that in the waking world Wellam and the scholars of Bergenworth came into possession of the orphan's umbilical cord, or a part of it, and used it for their experimentation. The cord belonged to Kos and if it allowed Ram to ascend, it would seem to Michael Ash and the scholars that Ram had been reborn, vacuous like a newborn, and that Kos was Ram's mother, with Ram now acting as a surrogate for the dead great one. Third umbilical cord descriptions reads, Every great one loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate. It's the umbilical cord that allows a human to ascend or be reborn, but it requires a full umbilical cord and more for the player hunter to ascend in the childhood's beginning ending. An umbilical cord is a bridge to a baby's mother, but it needs to be connected to a medium, something that can convey sustenance, and in Bloodborne it's the blood that imbibes and sustains. All this seems to confirm that Ram was a result of experimentation at Bergenworth, having her brain lined with eyes and using the orphan's umbilical cord to ascend. But it may be that Ram was considered somewhat of a failure. Instead of sharing the secrets attained by her enlightenment Ram is unable to communicate in any meaningful way. The spider hides all manner of rituals, certain to reveal nothing, for true enlightenment need not be shared. But while Ram is unable to share her secrets, she does serve a critical purpose. The Bergenworth spider hides all manner of rituals and keeps our lost master from us. A terrible shame. It makes my head shudder uncontrollably. Ram is seemingly responsible for the concealment of the blood moon, for keeping the ritual to beckon the blood moon a secret. After defeating Ram the apparition of Yarnam, the Myrian queen of blood is seen infiltrating the moonside lake. The queen stands weeping before a blood moon that quickly descends amid the cries of baby Mergo. Note seen after defeating Ram reads, Ritual secret broken. Seek the nightmare newborn. The hunter receives these instructions from the moon presence guiding them to the next phase of the hunt. It would appear that everything up to this point has steered the hunter towards removing Ram who is proving a hindrance to the descent of the blood moon and its eldritch truth. Lake Rune description reads, Great volumes of water serve as a bulwark guarding sleep and an auger of the eldritch truth. Overcome this hindrance and seek what is yours. It's no coincidence that Ram is fought within the moonside lake and that it is so closely tied to the moon. Willem and the scholars are seemingly obsessed with the moon and the study of it. Bergenworth is littered with linariums, devices for illustrating the motion and phases of the moon, and the most central and massive component of the Bergenworth building is a telescope for studying the skies. The scholars were clearly interested in the moon. They studied history and archaeology and were aware of the moon's historical significance. When the red moon hangs low, the line between man and beast is blurred. And when the great ones descend, a womb will be blessed with child. The School of Menses, one of the main branches of the healing church which has its roots at Bergenworth sought to beckon the moon, Jahargul, unseen village lore note reads, Madmen toil surreptitiously in rituals to beckon the moon. And it appears they succeeded, as long ago in old Jarnam the red moon descended, the red moon hangs low, and beasts rule the streets. Are we left with no other choice than to burn it all to cinders? The school of Menses appears to be one of the earliest branches of the healing church, based on the proximity of the unseen village's grounds to old Yarnum. The ritual to beckon the moon must have happened long ago. Central Yarnum lore note reads, When the hunt began, the healing church left us, blocking the great bridge to Cathedral Ward, as old Yarnum burned to the ground that moonlit night. 
The nameless moon presence beckoned by Lawrence and his associates. Pale blood. Behold. A pale blood sky. These notes tell us that the hunt, as it is called, the cycle of hunters being imprisoned in the hunter's dream and undertaking the will of the moon presence or pale blood, began on the night that old Jarnam was burned to the ground beneath the blood-red moon, and it was at this crucial moment that the healing church and its leadership retreated into their cathedral ward, leaving the Yarnamites to turn into beasts and burn. With Yarnam burning and the red moon turning the blood drunk into beasts, the church was in crisis. It was perhaps at this point that Lawrence turned to his old master for help. There are still mysteries to what unfolded next, but it would appear that Ram was able to be utilized to forestall the worst effects of the Red Moon and obscure the eldritch reality from the remaining citizens of Yarnum and some members of the church. The college and the woods surrounding it became forbidden grounds and only those who knew the old adage of the healing church and Bergenworth fear the old blood could gain admittance. A curious display of cooperation between the two institutions, as the password keeper is a scholar of Bergenworth who perhaps knew the stakes, should Rum ever be destroyed by a being who sought the descent of the Red Moon once more. A popular theory about Rum is that Rum is the surrogate child of Ebriatus. The one-third of umbilical cord, or cord of the eye, is a relic that comes from an infant great one. In Bloodborne, the cord of the eye is used to make contact with great ones. What about the cord that imposter Iosefka possessed? The cord that we retrieve from her says that Provost Willem sought the cord in order to elevate his being and thoughts. If the cord was used by Willem, and the cords grant an audience with the infant great one to whom it belongs, then this cord very likely belongs to Ram. Ram was possibly one of the special children that Miyazaki talks about in the future press game guide who was chosen by a great one to ascend and become their child. Whether this occurred with the help of Willem, or occurred in ancient Thumaru, there is evidence to suggest that Ram is the child of Ebriatus. We find a body that looks remarkably similar to Ram on the altar of despair, which Ebriatus kneels before as if in prayer. This may be the slumbering body of Ram at the altar of despair where we meet Ebriatus. Beyond this piece of evidence, there are also some similarities in how we encounter Ebriatas and Ram that further supports this. They both start out passive in their boss fights, and they both use arcane attacks. These similarities, combined with the appearance of a Ram-like figure at the Altar of Despair are enough to link Ram to Ebriatas, and therefore link the cord that Willem used to Ram, the infant great one to which it belonged. Also, Ebriatas is named after a butterfly and Ram appears to be a caterpillar rather than a spider. Ram's blood when attacking her head is the same color as Ebriatus, and kin are said to be kin of the cosmos. Another theory is that Ram is the result of a successful ritual that was undertaken on the research patients. In the early days of the healing church, the great ones were linked to the ocean, and so the cerebral patients would imbibe water and listen for the howl of the sea. Brain fluid writhed inside the head, the initial makings of internal eyes. If we follow the story of Saint Adeline, she eventually becomes an enlarged head because she has imbibed brain fluid expanding her head until it is all that she is. But Adeline's case is a little different to the other patients. She is almost a success story in that she is able to perceive the milkweed rune, the language of the great ones. She also looks different to the other enlarged heads. She is drawn out, elongated. What if this is a similar process that Ram went through? Ram is essentially a head full of eyes. So what if Ram also imbibed water or eyes until her head expanded and it became all that she was? The mental state of the patients certainly deteriorates as they progress. And if that sac containing their enlarged head were to mature, would the internal eyes mature along with it and eventually transform them into something like Ram? If we look at Ram's head, it is that same ashen color as Adeline's head before it becomes tinged with blood. And if a head did expand till it was just eyes, then one can imagine it might look a lot like Ram's. Another kin great one is the Celestial Emissary. The Celestial Emissary is an optional boss in Bloodborne. 
The celestial emissary is initially disguised as one of the numerous celestial minions, and its appearance changes very little when it changes phase, other than significant growth in size and eyes glowing cosmic blue. The celestial emissary is possibly the healing church's most successful experiment in a long line of failures. In the early days of the healing church, the great ones were linked to the ocean. In an attempt to make contact with the great ones, patients would imbibe great quantities of water. Without even the lofty goal of communicating with the great ones, these patients would simply listen with heads bound and eyes covered. Listening for the howl of the sea and the unfathomable, unspeakable utterings of the great ones. The fluids they ingested writhed inside their heads, the initial makings of internal eyes. These patients would imbibe so much water that it would cause their heads to expand. The process was seemingly agonizing. Patients found in the research halls begged to be put out of their misery, believing that they must have done something horribly wrong to be subjected to such a fate. Most of these experiments would end in death, the corpses then cast into the acidic poisonous pool at the foot of the stairs to be dissolved, and the whole process began again on fresh patients. The early experiments were overseen by Lady Maria who was regarded by the patients as a motherly figure. Patients who showed the most potential were given the task of tending the lumen flowers growing in the shadow of the clock tower. Maria believed that the scent of the flowers would bring comfort to them in their agonized state of mind, perhaps allowing them to think and listen more clearly. However, despite all her attempts, Maria's greatest success was still deemed a failure. Outside her home in the astral clock tower the living failures tended to the large lumen flowers. These creatures are clearly the final stage of transformation for the patients. Their sack-like heads exactly resemble those of the cerebral patients tending the gardens below, but their bodies have stretched and distorted, their skin taking on a bluish hue. Perhaps it was a combination of the water and the dubious blue elixir that brought these failures into existence. Blue elixir which is found in large quantities throughout the research hall is known to be used in experimentation, and therefore may account for their blue tinge. Whatever the case, these creatures appear to be almost mindless. What value they have, if any, is in their ability to make contact with the cosmos. During the boss battle against the living failures individual failures frequently summon a partial and cloudy representation of the stars. When all working together they are able to open up the cosmos for an even longer period of time, raining down meteors upon the player. This behavior indicates that what control they have over the cosmos may be chaotic and dangerous. Or perhaps they are regarded as failures because, despite their ability to bring the cosmos into a palpable plane of existence, their almost vacuous state of mind renders them unable to communicate knowledge of the Great Ones should they ever come across it. Whatever the reasons, they were deemed failures and Maria died without seeing the success she and the members of the church along with her would seemingly do anything to achieve. This early technique of imbibing water was unsuccessful. The water, though linked with the Great Ones, did not create inner eyes, just the workings of them. Despite all the failures and the death of Maria, the church was not willing to give up on its goal to make contact. Once, a young girl had an older brother who was determined to become a doctor, and so she willfully became his patient. In the end, this led to their encounter with the eldritch truth, for which they considered themselves blessed. We fail to realize our own latent potential, until the moment it is lost, and we sense its absence. This description from the brain fluid item indicates four things. First, that humans are born with the latent potential to make contact with the eldritch truth, that is the Great Ones, and that this young girl was able to make contact in some form or another successfully. Third, this experimentation may have been happening around the time of Lady Maria and her experimentation with the cerebral patients because the description is on the brain fluid item which describes events of that time. Lastly, there comes a time when we lose that potential, and once gone, it never comes back. It is strongly indicated that this is during adolescence. The orphanage, located in the upper cathedral ward, was founded to investigate and harness the potential of young humans to make contact with the Great Ones. On some level this line of thinking makes sense. As children our imaginations are perhaps more vivid, 
our minds unformed and our bodies developing. Children are more susceptible to external influences. In order to find patients in which to experiment on, the church targeted the most vulnerable members of Yarnum's society, its orphans. These orphans would not be missed, they had no caregivers to check up on them, or grieve their loss. The church may have promoted the orphanage as a refuge for these children, a safe place for them to go to for protection from the dangerous creatures on Yarnum's moonlit nights. The orphanage, shadowed by the Grand Cathedral, became a place of scholarship and experimentation, where young orphans became potent unseen thinkers for the healing church. Potent indicates their abilities were on a higher plane than any human, and the necessity that they be unseen becomes clear. As the healing church would not want the Yarnum public to know what they were turning these orphan children into. We know that the celestial emissaries were once human who have become kin, from the actions of imposter Iosefka. But what form the children took in these early stages is not clear. We know that the orphanage was established before the choir, and that the phantasm experiments created the choir. While the orphanage was being established, the church carried out an inquiry into an alternative means of making contact, phantasms. Phantasms are the augurs of the Great Ones and these slug-like creatures appear to have a deep connection to them. The body of Kos was completely riddled with phantasms, and within the chalice dungeons many phantasms are found, traces to the presence of the Great Ones. Long ago before the cerebral patients, Burgenworth discovered that looking into a soft eye blessed by a phantasm revealed a vast stretch of dark sky that rumbles with an endless meteor storm. In other words, it showed them the cosmos. Though nothing ever became of this discovery. The idea that phantasms may be the key must have taken root in the consciousness of those scholars who would one day make up the healing church. The church began performing rituals and rites, experimenting with phantasms. We can see this use of phantasms in the pearl slug ritual material which are apparently juvenile phantasms and are a material exclusively used in his rituals. The church was eventually able to use phantasms to reach a lofty plane of darkness, like the vast stretch of dark sky seen in the black sky eye. Despite reaching a new plane, the church failed to make contact with any great ones in the outer reaches of the cosmos, instead the right produced a small exploding star. The right would become known as a call beyond because that is exactly what it was. But the church was not done with phantasms. An even more tangible rite was performed and with such success that it managed to bring a great one into mankind's plane of existence, from the land of Is. Phantasms were used to partially summon abandoned ebriators. This summoning marked the beginning of an inquiry into the old labyrinth, focused on the land of Is, and was the reason for the establishment of the choir. The choir was made up of the upper echelons of the healing church, and formed a distinct entity separate from the school of Menses which operated out of Yarhagel. They saw themselves as a delegation to the Great Ones. The choir's base of operations was the upper cathedral ward, where the cerebral patients had been experimented on, where the astral clock tower overshadowed the land, where we find the celestial emissary and where the orphanage was founded. The orphanage is the birthplace of the choir, created by its members. Since we know the orphanage was the birthplace of the choir, it is certain that the orphanage existed prior to the choir. We can also surmise that the primary members of the newly established choir were made up of researchers and scholars from the orphanage. From its inception, the choir was made up of those scholars who continued the work that began at Bergenworth, attempting to make contact with the Great Ones of the Cosmos. Their exclusive membership indicates that their work was to be done in secret, and a secret among a select number of peers is much more easy to keep. Partial summoning of ebriators created intense interest in discovering the cosmos from within the old labyrinth. According to the choir, the land of this lies in contact with the cosmos, which allowed the Great Ones to function on transcendental planes of thought. We can see this when exploring the Ischalis dungeons. Hints of space matter, 
and stars can be seen manifesting seemingly at random in midair. When used with certain rituals, great chalices unlock deeper reaches of the old labyrinth. By using the Is great chalice the choir was able to reach the land of Is, allowing them to have an audience with Ebriatus. This chalice was found within the old labyrinths, and it's note that it was the first great chalice brought back to the surface since the time of Burgenworth indicates that the church had lost interest in these labyrinths prior to partially summoning Ebriatus. The success of the ritual and the contact with an actual great one cemented the great is chalice as the cornerstone of the choir. So by this point the choir had discovered and was in communion with an actual great one. But the choir garb description indicates that Ebriatus was just as separated and ultimately stranded from contact with her brethren in the outer cosmos as mankind, it reads. Together with the left behind great one, they look to the skies, in search of astral signs, that may lead them to the rediscovery of true greatness. The fact that the choir worked alongside and was aided by Ebriatus indicates that they shared a common goal. Ebriatus is called abandoned and this along with the fact that Ebriatus searches for astral signs to rediscover the Great Ones, indicates she is almost as helpless as mankind. The choir stumbled upon an epiphany, very suddenly and quite by accident. Here we stand, feet planted in the earth, but might the cosmos be very near us, only just above our heads. The goal of the orphanage and the choir was to make contact with the Great Ones of the cosmos. The choir realized that the cosmos, the stars in the sky above us, were not actually far away, they were on a different plane. One that required the right eyes to see it. The idea that the world of Yarnum is built atop planes is made most apparent in the hunter's nightmare. When an enemy found exclusively in the fishing hamlet simply drops from the sky into the river of blood. When the player ascends the astral clock tower they enter into the fishing hamlet literally exposing it as a layer of reality placed physically above the hunter's nightmare and its river of blood. In the same way are the cosmos not literally placed right above our heads, closer than we can perceive. The sky and the cosmos are one. But despite this convincing hypothesis the scholars had no way to act upon it nor to substantiate contact with the great ones that existed in planes within reach but outside of mankind's perception. As mentioned, the choir viewed themselves as a delegation to the Great Ones. But who would go before them, ushering them into their presence? Who would find a way to make contact? The choir began to look into someone or something that could connect them with the cosmos, the celestial space belonging to the heavens above. Someone or something that could act as an emissary, sent on a special diplomatic mission on their behalf as their representative. No such creature existed, so they were forced to make them. The children of the orphanage took on a new purpose. With the knowledge gained from extensive experimentation and study, and the use of the old blood possibly given by Ebriatus and a belief that insight was key, the choir began to create the celestial emissaries, continuing the experimentation begun long ago under the leadership of Lady Maria. The dubious blue elixir appears to have been used as an anesthetic that numbs the brain so that these strange experiments by high ministers of the healing church could be carried out. This elixir dilutes the physical presence of whoever ingests it, perhaps indicating that it is partially exposing the user to another plane of existence. The emissaries created were a seemingly much greater success story than before. We can see in the attacks of the emissaries that they are able to connect with the cosmos. Using a call beyond with more precise control, affixing the stars in place around their heads. They also emit an eerie, inhuman sound incessantly, reminding of the echoes of language listened for by the cerebral patients that the Great Ones seem to emit without conscious thought. Their heads, like the cerebral patients, have swelled to an inhuman size. But instead of being filled with water, they are filled with eyes. We can see this as the numerous small glowing lights in their heads are the same color, and size as the glowing eyes we see on their faces. What connection the emissaries have to the lumen flowers is unclear. Those in the lumen flower garden appear to be tethered to our plane of existence by the flowers themselves, appearing out of nowhere as if beckoned by some unheard voice. 
This behavior exactly mimics that of the living failures, who will not stop spawning among the flowers until altogether defeated. They also seem to behave as a kind of hive mind. The celestial emissary boss likely exerts control over the smaller emissaries, bending them to its will. The interconnectivity of the emissaries is reminiscent of the way in which the living failures work together to open up the cosmos during their boss battle. It seems then that the primary purpose of the celestial emissaries is to act as just that, an emissary on behalf of the choir to the cosmos. Perhaps their secondary purpose was allowing communication between Ebriatas and the choir. But it seems first and foremost that they were an attempt at rediscovering the true greatness that left the world of blood born long ago. Cheers to the discovery of kinship. Doesn't it make you feel warm inside? Last group is the failed great ones. Most noticeable of this group are the living failures. The living failures are a boss in Bloodborne's The Old Hunters DLC. The living failures resemble a celestial minion, although their heads have melted into their bodies and they lack any facial features. Like the emissary, they can cast powerful energy orbs and are also capable of summoning meteors. Despite looking the same, the failures have two variants, the arcane and the brute. The arcane will simply act as a ranged combatant, casting slow traveling arcane orbs either multiple but small homing orbs, or a large explosive one. The Brood variant merely follows the player and tries to attack them by flailing its arms or hitting with their heads. Due to their location in the Lumenwood Garden and proximity to the research hall, it's likely that these creatures are the result of the Healing Church's attempts to create a celestial emissary through human experimentation with the old blood. The blue hue to their skin is reminiscent of that boss as well as the much smaller celestial minions that are found in the Lumenflower Gardens. The Healing Church, even in its infancy, began experimenting methods to trigger the evolutionary process of humanity, all in order to transcend it beyond its mortal coil. As such, they experimented with the patients in the research hall and despite their many tries. They only managed to be the source of several insane, screeching humanoid beings with bulbous leathery heads and bodies that became stretched. The only patients that came close to success were ultimately failures. That is what the living failures are. The prototype to what inevitably became the celestial emissary. And their parallels are not only evident by their physical appearance, with a pale blue body, stretched limbs and bloated heads, but also by their abilities, as they are capable of unleashing several arcane blasts and even one that appears to be similar to Ram's arcane meteors. They are labeled kin of the cosmos in the official guide. Last failed great one we will discuss in this video is the One Reborn. The One Reborn is a colossal, undead mass. He is reborn as part of the Menses ritual. It is located in Advent Plaza after Ram, the vacuous spider is defeated. You can summon the old hunter defector Amtal with the old hunter bell to assist you in this battle. Born from an unholy Thamerian ritual which used the bodies of Yarnum's populace. The One Reborn is an amalgamate of grotesque misshapen and decayed body parts assembled to form one massive unliving creature. It has a singular giant humanoid torso attached to the entire mass which controls its entire being. Though other parts of its body seem just as independently alive as the humanoid on top of the horrific creature. It has an inherent weakness to fire and bolt damage but is strong against arcane. The One Reborn was the final, presumably failed result of an unholy experiment to ascend humankind to the status of Great Ones. It is also speculated that it may be the last line of defense of the school of Menses against the choir or our player character. It is summoned by the bell-ringing women as a mass of beings from other worlds to prevent us from trespassing into Nightmare of Menses. These beings could be dead inhabitants of Jahar Ghul, or the Menses scholars who died as a result of the previous ritual. The One Reborn is the school of Menses' last line of defense. As told through the descriptions of the bell items, we know that the bells originated in the underground Thamerian labyrinth and were capable of reaching into other worlds and summoning beings from them. Although humans require insight to use these bells, it's likely that the bell maidens that summon the One Reborn are Thamerians allied with the church like the church servants 
and church giants. Even if they aren't, it's likely any humans in the service of the school of Menses and in Yahargul during the blood moon have insight to spare. It is the point of this theory that the bells used to summon the one reborn are no different. And that the bell maidens in the one reborn arena ring their bells repeatedly and simultaneously en masse to bring a mass of beings from other worlds simultaneously. Coalescing all of them into one horrible amalgamation in the process of their summoning. The purpose of this would be to prevent hunters such as the player from interfering with Michael Ash and Menses' plots involving the Menses' ritual and the nightmare of Menses. After all, they are likely unaware that the scholars have undergone the stillbirth of their brains and, to the best of their knowledge, are still plumbing the nightmare for answers from a higher plane. Ordinarily, these bells summon only beings willing to cross between worlds. It is possible that the humans summoned to form the One Reborn are unwillingly summoned via unknown methods that the myriads such as the Bell Maidens might be privy to. If this is the case, the One Reborn may simply be lashing out in pain and horror at the player. Alternatively, it is conceivable that the humans summoned this way are willing fanatics devoted to the school of Menses who await in a parallel dimension to be called upon to create a last-ditch defense in the base reality of your own game world. If the One Reborn has any sentience remaining, it may manifest the combined desires of these fanatics to protect the scholars. Such a case would also explain the inhuman utterances that the One Reborn uses for its spells, as members of Menses might have knowledge of such incantations. Such an undertaking is abominable, even by the standards of the school of Menses. Thus why they would only resort to it when someone came too close to making the scholars abandon the dream.